Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians, if you don't mind. And if you do, sorry. But that's where we are, Ephesians. Uh, good to have you here. Good to have you all online. Uh, let's see here, where are we going here? Ephesians 5. Uh, let's start... Let's see here. Let's start in. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to I'm going to get to verse 18, but let me read a few verses down <clears throat> so we get the gist of it. He mentions in um, verse nine the fruit of the spirit. He mentions in verse eight uh, the or and before that. Uh, from verse 1 down to verse 8, fornication, filthiness, all of that stuff. Don't, don't be in with people that are doing these things like whoremongers and unclean persons and things like that. He said in verse 7, be not ye therefore partakers with them. There is not much said nowadays uh, concerning... Uh, biblical separation. Um, it does not mean let's all let's all build a commune down in northwest Arkansas and all live down there and we'll all share off each other. Nope, that's not biblical. They say, well, they did it in the Book of Acts. They started out doing that in the Book of Acts, but they didn't keep doing that. That was not something that was intended to to stay very long. The hippies tried everything they could to make the commune system work. And once you get used to eating and enjoying what everybody else has, you have very little uh, incentive to go out and bring in some of your own. Why should you? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like the college professor that decided he was going to give everybody the same grade, which would be the highest grade of any test. And so for the first test, everybody got like a 98, 99, something like that. And after a while, the smart kids figured out, why should we study for everybody? And the grades started going, it doesn't work. It just, there's no incentive. There's no push. There's no reason for it. So anyway, God, God, God didn't want that. Uh, but biblical separation is, um, well, let me quote you a verse. Come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's 2 Corinthians 6. And so he tells us to separate ourselves from those things and from those people. Um, and so he tells us, verse 15... See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. I mentioned this morning at the end of the service uh, that I knew uh, sometime back uh, that the devil would try uh, to get in here and start chipping away at the good things that God was doing. And um, yep, it sure happens. And so it is all of our responsibility to walk circumspectly, to look around, to make sure uh, that everybody's safe. We're walking in, um, uh, Paul said that in the last days, perilous times shall come. It means very deadly, dangerous. Your life is in peril. So uh, walk that way. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are good, right? Nope. Days are evil. The days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Uh, I still like that verse uh, that the brother shared with me yesterday uh, about establishing your works unto the Lord, do everything as unto the Lord, and He will establish your thoughts. And 
that verse has just just been pounded on me the last couple days and and I've it's been in a good way it's done a lot of good for me um, wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is and I'm telling you the only way you will get that is uh, for the Lord to establish your thoughts you'll know the will of the Lord when he guides your thoughts to that and he will um, I've had people th throughout the years um, ask me about, you know, the Lord's will and how you find it. And I have, you know, I've heard a lot of answers from people. And I've heard, I've heard this thing about, well, maybe God wants you to take the first step. I do not believe in that. Uh, I do not believe it's biblical. I don't believe it's right. The disciples of Jesus did not start walking in a direction and then Jesus says, Okay, you're, going, you're doing the right thing. I'll follow you. He said, follow me. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. And then the Israelites going through the wilderness, they had no idea where they were going. They had no idea where they were going. It's kind of like being out in the midst of the sea on an overcast day. You have no sun and no stars to guide you. And you're, when you're in the middle of the ocean, how can you even tell where north, south, east, west are. You can't even tell that. And um, that's, what, that's what it's like to not have your thoughts established by the Lord. You're out in a place that there is no way that you can navigate because you can't see the sun, you can't see the stars and the moon. And for me, it wouldn't do any good if I knew where every one of them were. Wouldn't help me one bit. I'd say, okay, I know where north is. See the north star, I see, okay. But that, other than that, it wouldn't help me. Uh, I'm going to throw this in real quick. I'm going to make a little short video out of this. Um, the year Lisa and I took an Alaskan cruise, we went whale watching, and we were in all these little islands and fjords and everything else on the coast of Alaska. It is a... It is filled with little islands and little things sticking up. And then you have these whales. And they had a book of whale tales. And they had a name for all the whales. Because they said they come back to the same area every year. You remember that story. And, I, and she, the lady said that a uh, certain time of year, the whales leave Alaska and they go down to Hawaii and they calve, and when their calves are grown to a certain size or whatever, or age or whatever, they start migrating back, and they always come back to this same area in Alaska. And I am like, I may be the only one gobsmacked by this. Because you're talking about a creature who's navigating underwater. If you think navigating on top of the water is hard, we build multi-billion dollar submarines who have to come up every now and then just enough to check their bearings to make sure they're in the right place because they're guessing underwater. They're going by their speed and how far they went, and, and, but they have to come up every now and then, get a radio check and a GPS to make sure their, their maps jive with this. And here these whales, they know when to leave Alaska they know how to navigate all the way down to the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean, give birth down there, and then come back all the way up to the exact same island that they were here last year. And they can tell because of the whale tails, and they're all made differently. And I'm just like, I asked the lady, I said, does science know how these whales are able to do that? They said, no, they have no idea. I said, I know. We have a God, he's the creator. That's, I said that out loud. I don't know if anybody appreciated it or not, but I said, I believe in a God, okay? That's not a problem for me. Amen. Now, verse 18. And I think I started on this last week, but we're gonna go to um, Isaiah here before too long. Be not drunk with wine, Wherein is ex excess, but be filled 
with the Spirit. I mentioned to you last week about Kenneth Hagin and these other spiritual drunkards. Uh, they have changed this. They've changed the whole meaning of it. Um, they, even, they even say that in Acts chapter 2, that the reason why the people uh, there who were watching all of these Christians, all these believers, all these uh, Jews, I guess, who are now speaking in other languages, um, and, you know, doing all this, and the people around them saying, you know, these, these men must be full of new wine, you know, here it is, only the third hour of the day. And Hagen says, they must have been doing things that made everybody think that they were drunk because they were drunk. They were acting like drunks. And then he goes into this little thing that he does where he says drunks fall down. He's got people falling all over the place and drunks reel around and drunks stagger and drunks do this and drunks do that. He's got everybody in the church doing this and they're all getting drunk in the spirit, acting like drunks, acting like fools what they're doing. So anyway, be not drunk with wine wearing his excess, but be filled with the spirit. Um, let's see here. Turn to Isaiah 28. Many, many, many years ago, uh, I was listening to a guy who had mentioned that physical drunkenness was a picture of spiritual drunkenness and uh, wine and strong drink were a picture of false doctrine. And so um, Isaiah begins in verse 28, or excuse me, verse 1 of chapter 28, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. And um, we're going to see strong drink brought into it down in verse 7. Uh, he, says, he says in verse 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one, which is as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand. That, that mighty and strong one um, who's coming as a destroying storm and as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, um, I believe to be a reference to Antichrist, um, who God sends to this world as, as a punishment, as a judgment, because every, everybody that follows him now is going to come down under the wrath of God. So he says in verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. And he's going to explain that in a little bit. And the glorious beauty. No, you know what? I just, it just hit me. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. In Matthew chapter 5, um, Jesus is giving what they call the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks about several things in there, and he gives, you know, the Beatitudes, blessed are they that do this, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who mourn, for they should be comforted, and so on. And then he says uh, to his disciples, um, you know what, I better read it, that uh, it's possible, and they better get things right, and do things right, and act right, and live right, uh, yeah, verse 13 of Matthew 5. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? In other words, where, how can the earth be salted if we have lost our savor? Okay, we're the salt of the earth. And salt is needed by every creature, I guess, that there is, um, including us humans. Uh, we need salt in our diet. We need salt as, as uh, part of our metabolism. 
But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Notice this, it is thenceforth good for what? Nothing. But to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. That's what, what I was thinking of when I read that verse back in, in, in Isaiah 28, 3. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. And back here Jesus says, the salt, if it's lost its savor, is good for nothing and to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. One of the things I fear the most, beyond any shadow of a doubt, is the thought of being cast away by God because I'm good for nothing anymore. Uh, that drives me, that compels me. Uh, that's what knocks at my door um, when I'm... When I'm low or when I'm not right, uh, it is the thought of being cast out by God and being called as good for nothing and being trodden under the foot of men. And so this, I would say the same idea is attached now uh, to this issue of drunkenness. And he says in verse, back in Isaiah 28 verse 4, in the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. And he says in verse 5, And that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Now notice this. God is always going to have a a residue. He's always going to have a group of people that are always going to believe him. Uh, he shows us this um, when God, when Elijah was complaining to God, uh, it is enough. Now, Lord, take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. Um, Elijah was like, he was literally, he was in a cave. He was uh, he was down, he was depressed, he had had this great victory over Jezebel and over the, her prophets and God had sent the fire down from heaven and you would think that he would take that as a marching banner and just storm, uh, storm the gates and have Ahab run out and say let's get us in a king who's going to follow God. You would think that he would be on top of the world. I'm here to tell you I have seen it, especially in my life, how at times when I feel like I am doing the best that I can, really prospering in the Lord, really putting it out there, man, that God will let the devil come and beat me to death. He'll do it. Why? Why? So don't get proud. Last thing you want and the last thing you need is a proud pastor up here. It's the last thing in the world you guys need. Uh, I remember one Sunday, man, I preached my guts out. And it was just, boy, I mean, God was everywhere. And I walked down off the stage, I walked to my office. And I mean, the pain that hit me and went through my body. I literally collapsed on my couch and I laid there just and just the fatigue and everything like that. And I'm like, man, what in the world? Um, but it'll happen. It will happen. It'll happen it again. And uh, but God's always going to have a residue. And so God tells Elijah, Elijah, don't worry about it. He said, uh, number one, I'm still God here. OK. Uh, number two, um, you know, I've got this guy, Elisha. He's going to take over for you. He didn't say this to Elijah, but ends up Elisha is going to do twice as much as Elijah did. So that's better. But then he tells Elijah, Elijah, I've got 7,000 people that have never kissed Baal. Now that sounds weird, but imagine a Roman Catholic kneeling down before an image and kissing it. And they do. Uh, kneeling down before a bishop 
or a cardinal or a pope and kissing his ring. Okay? Won't you just kiss the rest of him too while you're there? Okay? Because that's basically what it is. But what God was saying is they, they do this thing where they kneel before the image of Baal and they kiss it. That's their adoration of this God called Baal, this statue that they've turned into a God. And God said, I've got 7,000 that have never done that. You don't have to worry, Elijah. I'm still going to carry on. And so Paul said, to this day, there is a, he didn't use the word residue, but there is, I can't remember the word that he used, but he said, there's a, there's a, a group that I have reserved for these last days. And we know that from Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, 12 tribes. He's got 12,000 from each tribe reserved. God's already got them picked out. He knows who they are. And uh, I've heard people say various things like, oh, I'm, I'm one of those people. And, no, you're not. Wishful thinking. So anyway, unto the residue of his people. Now verse 6, and for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Verse 7. Now, here we are. In fact, let's pray. You haven't prayed yet. Father, I ask you to bless... Your word tonight, uh, give me help from above, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. They have also erred through wine, and here it is, through strong drink, are out of the way. So number one, they've erred. Means their doctrine, and we're not talking about whether Adam had a belly button, okay, we're not, you know, we're not talking about anything like that. Not these minor, silly issues people argue about. We're talking about serious errors in doctrine. Um, like the, the having images in the church that are in some way going to be adored by the people before everybody gets out of that building. They're going to have some form of adoration uh, just like in that Lutheran church where that priest walked down the aisle, walked in front of this Jesus statue and read his prayer to this image. And, and I'm like, there it is right there. Okay. And so that's, that is a serious error that they have made. Uh, others are in thinking that man's scholarship trumps God's word. Okay? Man's scholarship does not trump God's word. God's word is right and true and always is and always will be the only way. Amen? But men who love to put flattering titles in front or behind their name Doctor, Ph.D., um, M.Div., which Master of Divinity. Um, they love to, huh? Yeah, they love to have those flattering titles. And uh, they like everybody to know that uh, they, have, they have searched and they have found errors in the Bible. And we're going to correct those errors. But in correcting those errors, they make new ones. And they're going to continue to make them. They're in, a, they're in a vicious cycle of constantly correcting errors in the text, which forces the Bible companies to correct errors in their translation, which then turns back because the Bible committee is there to look for errors. That's their, that's their purpose. It's their whole existence. Okay? If you lived... In northern Siberia, would you buy an air conditioner? Do you need it? No, you'll never need it. Okay, you'll need a big mosquito net is what you'll need, but you don't need a big air conditioner. Um, and so that's the way it is. If you have a committee whose sole purpose is to examine the manuscripts and look for errors, what are they going to spend their time doing? Examining the manuscripts, looking for errors. Are they going to find any? It's their job. 
And so every revision time, I think they're working on the 29th revision of the New Testament. Every revision time, they're finding mistakes that they have corrected. So that then you're going to have the 30th revision. It's, a, it's a, just a bad cycle. They have erred through, they've erred through wine. It's a spirit that's in them. And through strong drink are out of, notice this, that phrase, the way. You know what? I have a, I have a hunch on something. How many times is that in the Bible? Seems like I remember. Don't watch me be wrong. The way. No, it doesn't, doesn't add up. 374, I don't know what that is. Anyway, Jesus said, I am the way. Okay? Um, the way of salvation, the way of, of doctrine, the way that Christianity should go in and be in is what he's referring to. They are out of the way. Through strong drink are out of the way. They were drunk. And they can't walk a straight line. So they're out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. So all of these, number one, are symptoms of someone who's been uh, nipping gin all afternoon. Uh, or whatever it is they like to drink and they've been drinking at that and that's these are symptoms of how you can tell someone's drunk but he's also saying that these are also symptoms of someone and he mentions specifically the religious hierarchy the priest and the prophet the men who are supposed to dedicate their lives to God dedicate their lives to serving God and serving uh, the, the Jewish people, uh, the, the priests who carry out the sacrifices and who are the scribes who make sure that the word of God is correctly uh, uh, preserved, but also the prophets who are supposed to hear from God and convey that message to the people and especially to the king. But they're out there. They err in vision. How many, how many presidents have we had in this country that we can truly say God sent a man of God to that president to correct him so that he leads the country in the right way? How many, how many presidents in the last 40 years would even allow something like that? Republican or Democrat? No way. Okay? Um, that, when George Bush was running for president in 2000, he made sure, or his advisors made sure, that the religious right saw him as a character or a president that would give to the wishes of the religious right. So he has uh, uh, Franklin Graham. Uh, I don't know, if, I don't remember if Billy Graham was part of that too, but anyway, he made sure that they were seen together talking, okay? That's what they wanted. But as far as George Bush or any other president actually coming up with the goods, we're a worse country now than we've ever been, okay? So anyway, they're supposed to preach, and they're supposed to preach right, but they don't, and especially to the people who need it the most. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. And then, for all tables, uh, and one automobile are full of vomit, thanks to Bear the dog. Right, Michaela? You got a lesson on doghood, didn't you? 
I'll never forget it. She said, she's eating it. And I'm like, yep. It's what the Bible says. It's what they do. So anyway, for all tables are full of vomit. Think about this. Think about if we had communion and the guys handed you a cup and instead of the new wine in it, it had vomit in it. Okay? All tables are full of vomit. And I've said this generally every time I preach on this. The only thing as bad as a preacher who serves up vomit are the dogs in the congregation who lap it up. Uh, they deserve each other. They deserve each other. If they're going to allow that man to preach or that woman to preach things that they preach uh, and serve up vomit, then uh, they deserve it. All tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. And he means that both in the physical and the spiritual sense. So God now is asking, he's, he's shown you that there is a problem. He's shown you that there are prophets and priests that are, that are full of a, a spirit uh, of wine and strong drink. Um, there's actually a verse, let's see here, in Isaiah. Turn, to, turn over to the next chapter, Isaiah 29, and look in verse 9, if you would. He, he describes basically what they're under. Verse 9, Isaiah 29, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out, and cry, they are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Verse 10, now he's going to tell what it is. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he, what, covered. He covered them. God covered them. Why? Because they didn't want to see it. They didn't want to look in the Bible and see. Because most men of the cloth, I don't know why they call us that. He's a man of the cloth. But anyway, most pastors, preachers, whatever, they dare not preach on certain sins because they themselves are guilty of them. And so they don't want to see their sins mentioned in scriptures. So God doesn't let them see it. Um, just, I don't, I don't know, I don't have an example right on hand. But do you believe that God has the ability to open eyes and cover them? Sure he does. He has the ability in each one of us to either let us see what we're doing wrong or not see what we're doing wrong. Uh, to let others see what they're doing wrong or not doing wrong. To let us see things in the scriptures or not see things in the scriptures and make them up. And uh, <clears throat> then he goes on to explain the vision. But I'm going to go back to verse to chapter 28. Because in verse 9, he, uh, he, he's, like I said, he shows you that there's a problem. And now God is asking a question. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Uh, if you turn over very quickly, hold that place there and turn to Isaiah 53. Um, you'll see it again. 
God is asking a question, who, um, he does it in, in Isaiah 6, it just, uh, whom, shall I, whom shall I send? Okay, and then here in Isaiah 53, he's, he's asking again a question, who hath believed our report? And this is, this verse right here, this fact, this passage, is what the Apostle Paul referred to as obeying the gospel. He said, for they have not obeyed the gospel. Where it says, who hath believed our report? Obedience to the gospel is believing it. Do you believe that only Jesus can take away your sins? Do you believe that only Christ can give you righteousness? Do you believe, though, or do you believe, have you added man's doctrine into it that says, but you have to do things as well. You must do this and you must do that. Um, that's not the gospel, not even close to it. Anytime you add a work to the gospel, you don't have a gospel anymore. You got a false one. You have another gospel. Who hath believed our report? And to whom the, the arm of, is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then he goes on to talk about Christ. He is, verse 3, he is despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I love that. Love that passage i love that chapter because everything got fulfilled a thousand years later right on the cross all of this took place i love it so back in chapter 28 verse 9 whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine god is looking for people who will believe what he said and believe his word and then Notice this. Who teaches the knowledge? In verse 9. God does. Not me. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Is doctrine important? I can probably take you out tonight and drop you off at about five churches that you'll probably hear, man, we're not hung up on doctrine, we're hung up on Jesus. Uh, do that well, don't I? We're all about loving like Jesus loved. It's love, man, it's not religion. It's love. You hear this stuff like they were all hippies. You hear this stuff and they, and they have made religion a bad word. But I'm sorry, this is our religion. It is, we try, we try to make sure that we understand that pure religion and undefiled is this. That a man keep himself unspotted from the world. What was the second one? <laughs> yeah, to visit those in their affliction. I guess I need to brush up on that, don't I? So anyway, uh, whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. And Paul, the apostle, talked about that and made the analogy of the, the difference between milk and meat. And you're no longer on milk anymore now thank God you don't have to get up at two o'clock in the morning and feed this baby milk that only lasts about eight minutes and then it's hungry again now you can start I'll never forget when Lisa finally started mixing a little bit of oatmeal that baby oatmeal that is in a super fine powder form in with the uh, the formula and uh, I had a thing I called power feeding I didn't want to be up at three o'clock either she would go it's your turn yeah huh yeah I did, man. I'm not, I'm not lying either. 
But that night, that first night, when they had food in their belly all night, oh, yeah, yeah. But that's what it takes. Uh, this is why um, the two places in the Bible that tell us uh, the qualifications for a bishop is one of them says specifically, not a novice. In other words, not somebody that has newly come in. He may have zeal and want to save the world, but he doesn't have the knowledge to do it. He doesn't have, he's, he's not grown up yet. And I can see in my own life where I thought I was ready to be a pastor. And God said, no, you're not. You're not even close. You don't know how to, you don't know how to run a family. Um, so how can you handle the house of God? And so I'm going to make you go out and work with your hands and sweat and come home exhausted. And after you've learned how to earn a paycheck for your family, then we'll talk. And God did the talking. But anyway, verse 10 is a mystery to some people, but I get it, you get it. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And here a little here, here a little here. And that's what anybody who says that when they got saved or, or maybe they come to a place in their life where they just decided to get serious with God, they just started reading the Bible. And they will tell you, all of a sudden, they started seeing where in the Old Testament, he, they would read something and then they would remember something they, re they read in the New Testament. And they're like, whoa, are these things linked together? And yeah, okay, they are linked. And you know what? I, I, I went through, it just occurred to me, I went through three years of Bible college. Maybe they were holding this out on the fourth one. I don't know. But including an entire year of systematic theology one and two, and uh, where you get a book this thick on theology and theological terms. And um, I don't ever, ever remember any of my professors pointing out Isaiah 28, 10, and 11. Never. I don't, I don't remember hearing anything about it. Nothing about here a little, there a little. It was, it was theology, um, prepackaged as crackers in a cracker box. That's how I describe it, okay? And we've got it all packaged up for you. This is... This is what God is. This is what Christianity is. And uh, I'm not saying they were just so totally wrong. I'm just saying I don't ever remember hearing any of my professors point out specifically Isaiah 28, 10, and 11. Never. But the idea of doctrine is, he's telling it to you, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And now he says in verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So, what does that mean? Number one, Moses, here in Exodus, is the stammerer. He is hard of speech. And he uh, is sort of protesting God, saying, you can't send me to talk. Uh, I'm, I'm hard of speech. It was difficult for Moses to speak. And so he, we believe he was a stammerer. And so then God said, okay, I'll send Aaron. Aaron's probably going, thanks a lot, Moses. Thanks, bud. I make sure you get down the Nile River in one piece and you do this to me. Um, so he's, that's stammering lips. Another tongue is obvious to me. It's Greek. Stammering lips is the law, Moses. And to me, it just makes sense that God would give a man who had difficulty in people understanding what he said to a people who were never meant to understand what God said. 
the Jews, okay? Or those Jews, I'll say it that way. But now, in the New Testament, and this makes sense theologically and doctrinally, because Paul points out that because Christ is the high priest, but he's not from the tribe of Levi, so we know then that he is from, has to be from a different tribe. And Paul said if it's from a different tribe, then it must of necessity be a different law, a different commandment. Because it's a different high priest, not from the earthly tribe of Levi, but from the priesthood of uh, Melchizedek, the angelic priesthood. And so Christ is the high priest of that priesthood. Whether he was actually Melchizedek or not, I still don't know the answer to it. I lean that he wasn't, but anyway. But, and that's one of those things that I can be wrong about. I'm still going to heaven, I'm pretty sure on that one, okay? Uh, we're not going to fight over that issue and make it a thing. Well, we're going to start our own church then. It's not a big deal. But anyway... So with a new commandment and a new lawgiver, you have a new language. It's not Hebrew and uh, Aramaic. It's not just to the Jews. Greek was the world language because of Alexander the Great. Because of his conquering. And so... Now you've got people all over the known world speaking Greek. And the whole New Testament, all 27 books, written in Koine Greek. And that way everybody, Jew and Gentile, can get in on it. All the Jews know Greek. Paul knew Greek. Um, and all the Gentiles, they, they knew Greek because of Alexander the Great. And so you have this world language that people all over the world speak. Sound familiar? English. At the pinnacle of, you have 1611 King James Bible, and then around that time, you have British ships going all over the world, spreading their empire. The sun doesn't set on the British Empire was the theme. And bringing English to vast parts of the world. So now they can read the Bible. Um, but anyway, but he, he wrote it in Greek. Now, when Paul quoted this verse, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. I want to show you something odd. When Paul quoted this verse, I'm not going to say he didn't get it right. I'm going to say he quoted it different. He didn't quote it the way it is in Isaiah 28. In, Isaiah, in 1 Corinthians 14, um, uh, let's see here. Da, 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 uh, where is it? For with uh, for with uh, where is it? Um. What? Help me out here. Huh? Seven? Twenty-seven. Hike. The man's... No, that's not what I'm looking for, but you were close. Um... No... He that prophesied to edify the church. I want to say, with men, he quotes it as, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. Find that verse. With men of other tongues and other lips is how he quoted it. 
Uh, huh? 21. Hike. Try that. And in the law it is written. There it is. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. And when you go back and look at verse 11, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. He quotes it differently. Now, because somebody might bring this up to you to say, uh, there's variances in the Bibles. Because Paul didn't quote this right. There's errors, must be errors in it. Somebody didn't copy it, what Paul, Paul originally wrote, said it right. Somebody else didn't copy it right. So how would you respond to someone who would say to you that, that I can prove your Bible has errors in it and give you that by saying with men in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips when obviously it's not that way in verse 11. How would you answer somebody? Well, that's a good one. Just throw a Bible at them. Hit them in the face with it. <laughs> Say, I win. See? Okay. Best way to answer anybody's... And they're looking to be... They're looking to conquer you with their knowledge by asking you a question that they are pretty sure that you will never know how to answer in the whole of your life. And they think then that they, are, they have won, they have conquered you and defeated you, and therefore you are wrong. And they're right. That's why they do it. They, they're looking for a fight, and they go pick on people that they think they would never know the answer to this. Okay? And my thing is, it's best to answer... Somebody's question is like that with scripture. And the easiest way to do it, I would say it like this. Well, you see, I just think that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so, whose word is it? Is it Isaiah's word? Is it Paul's word? Is it your word or is it God's word? And if it's God's word, then guess what? The Holy Ghost told Paul to write it down exactly the way Paul wrote it down. And we have no proof whatsoever that it should be any different. So therefore, God is the one who told Paul, write it down this way. Okay? And I give the analogy, you, you don't have to use this, uh, but of seeing things from two different directions. You have two eyes, and they look at something from two different directions. And that's the way you're seeing it. You're getting part of the doctrine here a little, just like he said in verse 11. But you're getting the other part of it in the New Testament, just like Paul said. Does that make sense to everybody? It's all God's Word. Rule number one. No mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two. If somebody said, hey, there's a mistake in the Bible. Rule number one. No mistakes in the Bible. Let's stand to our feet. Somebody text me. They probably found the verse now and it's 20 minutes later. Yeah, Steve. Steve Geltz. It is. It is. Jerry, you're right. When, when, when Reg Kelly asked me to come down here two, about two years ago, he said, Mike, he said, I don't know really what, what's going on, but he, people are saying a lot of things about AI. He said, do you know anything about that? I went, gotcha. And so the, I had the idea of asking AI two significant theological questions. One was about the symbolism of the blood uh, of a lamb in the Old Testament versus the blood of Christ in the New Testament. 500 words or less. And it wrote out this amazing piece. And I took that down to Reg's church. And I didn't tell him where it, where it came from. I said, 
uh, is this what we believe about the blood of Christ? And I read word for word what AI said. And I said, now, who in here agrees with that? Everybody, and I said, I'm not setting you up. They said, yeah, but that, that's right. That sounds right. I said, guess what? No human wrote that. No human wrote that. That's what you need to understand about an AI computer is that it's not somebody in a cubicle typing in the answer to these responses because that's impossible. You would have to have double the people of the earth to answer the people of the earth. Okay? And I, I said this isn't coming from a company who wrote this out and told the computer, if anybody asks this question, respond this way. The AI brain took this in less than three seconds, wrote this, 500 words. And I had something else that I read to them too. And they all agreed that, that it was spot on. That was two years ago. I had that video up online. Now you're right. You're, you read this ad, ha, have AI help you with theological questions. Don't do it. It's, yeah, I don't either. I always thought since I watched Star Trek IV and I saw them talking to the computer, that I always thought, man, that'd be so cool to have the computer you talk to and to do, and I've got them now and I don't use it. But she still listens. No. Well, I want that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it is. Um, go on. Go online and type in AI video uh, Japan something. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't looked at the whole video. I just watched this interview with Ray Kurzweil, and they were showing uh, this video that AI come up with, and I'm telling you, it was, you could not tell the difference that it was an AI-generated scene from a, from a Japanese street with snow coming down, and, these, and they described these petals from these trees in Japan, you know, that drop down, and, and AI made like a 30-second film of that, and it, and it calls Tyler Perry to say, hold on, I'm going, to, I'm going to quit putting all my money into this big, massive studio for us to hire actors and, and, and people and invest it in AI because it can make a better movie than what we're making now for, for less money. A lot less money if it's free. Oh, God brought us up in this world to, to be part of this world in this time. He had a reason for it. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, uh, for the lesson tonight. Father, I pray, dear God, that all of us would be serious about our study, uh, about the things that we believe, the things that we hold to, Father. Let us never stray from them. Let us never walk to the left or to the right, but straight down the line. Lord, just bless us and keep us, Father, as your own. We pray in Jesus' name. And amen. God bless you tonight.